Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hard to believe we're down to the last three weeks before the final. Uh, and I've said this before last week, I know not perhaps all of you who are here now, let me let uh, joining, okay. All right, it doesn't say admit, but yeah, I assume. It says joining, that's a new one. I thought it was either admit or already in the meeting. Anyway, for those of you who might have missed uh, one of the lectures last week on, on uh, early modern architecture, I think it's important to mention that it, that is a given. I will say this, that at least one uh, slide of that and this lecture, the topic of early modern architecture is for two weeks. You see in the syllabus last week and this week, at least one of the slides you, you've either already seen or will see this week will be on right there. the slide identification. Very nice <laughs> image here. Okay, let me do the uh, speaker view. Okay, just so it's less distracting. Um, okay. Come here, Nova. Come up here. Don't okay. go back there. We gotta wait for Mia. You gotta look for her. Can you see her? <laughs> Somebody's mic is on when they might not know it. <laughs> it's fine as long as it doesn't go too far into the <clears throat> discussions of the topics that we have to uh, cover. And the first one is always some updating <clears throat> announcements, house cleaning, whatever you want to call that, which helps. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Then that's the fact that I have uh, guaranteed, and I'll say it again, I can tell you it is guaranteed that at least one of the slides from either last week's lecture, so those two, or this week's, by the way, last week's I posted, <clears throat> I think it was very late on Friday. So if you check before, you know, Saturday morning, you might not have seen it, but they're posted there now, both of last week's uh, part one of early modern architecture. Well, mostly it's late 19th and 20th century. So once again, from last week's lectures or today, uh, this week's, the week, we are going to meet on Wednesday, by the way. I know the next day is Thanksgiving, but three o'clock to 4.15 or so is, shouldn't be in it. We'll probably end early anyway on Wednesday. But yes, we'll finish up. We can't do this whole unit in one day, this second half, I mean. But one of those slides from last week or this week's lectures will be on the slide identification and at least one will be on the slide analysis section. The final, remember, is the same format and we'll review for it in, in detail uh, as the midterm, same requirements and uh, same length. And uh, you, you will, of course, want to be here for the review, the meeting prior to the actual final itself, when I'll cut the list down by about 40% for the study list, as well as the terms to know that could appear on the true false. So in other words, the same format, yes, the same format. Uh, but it's not cumulative, of course. I think everyone knows that, but I still have people occasionally asking me, you don't have to study anything before that was before the midterm. Okay. All right. Um, now, about your second papers, I've graded, uh, I either gotten back from one, but not both of the readers that I had working on them, as well as the ones I've graded. And so far, I've returned the grades to all of those that I've gotten back, or I graded myself, and pretty good overall. Nobody bombed the paper, and uh, there were mostly A's and B's. Um, and if you missed, like, you know, 10 or 15 points, I explained what it was you were, you know, if you got less than an A, I explained what was, you know, not uh, completed thoroughly and why those points were, were, were deducted. But that's not that many points to make up. Uh, again, it's entirely up to you. It's in your hands if you want to take advantage of up to 60 points of extra credit. In fact, I'm going to glance at the syllabus right now. I'm not going to, don't worry, name anybody at all. But as I see, the most extra credit anyone has well, there is someone here who has 40 points and one who has 30, but almost nobody else has more than 10 or even most people don't have any. Of course, you may not need extra credit. And don't forget, you can email me anytime during this semester uh, up until the final itself. After that, it's a moot point. And ask me, what is my grade to now? How many points do I have? And then you can see how many more you need to get the grade you want, of course. And that's confidential, obviously. 
Okay, um, and so when I get the rest of the second paper grades back, and I should have them, I hope, before I see you on Wednesday, you should see those in your inbox, those of you who haven't already gotten the grades back. And uh, all the papers had something worthwhile to say. That's, to me, the, the most important thing. None of them were just somebody, you know, just, you know, well, maybe a couple people were, but I didn't notice, neither did the readers, uh, doing any cut and paste, but but gave it some thought. The topic you wrote, every paper I've read so far or grade, or entered the grade four from the second batch was was reasonably well written and and gave the, the people gave it some, each student some serious thought. And that's a good sign and at least seemed to understand the basic concept. But they might have missed points on uh, one thing I'd give you a, a, a heads up because it's five points off. If, you, if I get a very fuzzy, unfocused image or muddy and I can't see the details, either I or my reader, that's five points off. Uh, and also, if you forget, some people are still forgetting to put their in-text citations. That's another five. So right there, you'd be down 10 points, of course. Um, and I still have a few people that haven't given me either one or, or their first or second paper. And um, I will send one more email reminder, possibly two more, before finals, because the cutoff is the week before finals for late work. And it points off as 10. It doesn't go up after that, because at this point already, it's more than a week, and that's when it goes to 10 since the due date for the uh, second paper. But so far, I, it's pretty I good. I just had a question. Did you say you, yes. you were complete, you were done grading and those should be in? Because I didn't- No, I said, the, um, yeah, a good, batch. important point, yeah. What I'm saying is that the ones that I've gotten back from one of my readers, okay, I'll go ahead and tell you, I don't think, I'm not giving away anything. One of my most experienced readers' father got, he's totally vaccinated, he's in his late seventies, and, and he had his booster and he was in the hospital on a ventilator. So I gave her a little extra time. Okay, okay. Back. I just wanted to make sure I understood. It could be that yours is one of those, I don't know, okay. but, but she's assured me she'll get them back this week. And I just emailed her and she's been responsible for two years now. And, and she'll probably get them to me in time okay. to get them to you by Wednesday, I hope. I understand. Four things. Uh, uh, Mr. Wilson? Yes, any uh, questions? This is yeah, this is more of a personal question, but it, it can maybe regard to other people, but I had turned my midterm in. You said, uh, and I have like the email that says that uh, when I had turned it out, September 27th, around 1042 p.m. or something like that. Uh, you said you never received it. Oh, there's an, uh, thank you. See, I'm trying to be proactive and, and, and not assume the negative. That's, I remember now. Yeah, I said, that is not as, I mean, I know I should have said, don't worry if you have, maybe I should have in the email. So I hope I didn't stress you out because, you know, I've got my own. Just a little bit, but it's right now good. I apologize. And except for the fact that I have said on these lectures, uh, but you might not have caught at the beginning of one or two of the past months lectures about midterms that I hadn't received them from everybody. I think I said that maybe even right after the midterm was turned in. Uh, and if that were the case, or you didn't get a grade by the time I think it was two weeks afterwards, I was able to return the grades for all those I had received. It just means you need to resend it. And you just confirmed, I'm sure this isn't going to be a problem for you or anyone else that this applies to. If you have the original email to show you submitted it, absolutely, I will grade it within 24 hours and get back to you with your, with your grade. I'll do oh, that. perfect. I won't send it to someone else to grade. So just do perfect. that uh, tonight. Now, tonight I have a class, so I'm not sure. I think I could do it, but by tomorrow, for sure, at the latest, tomorrow evening, I can get your grade back to you. So perfect. sorry for the, you know, I don't know why it went astray. It, some, it happens, you know, the internet, yeah, yeah. email and, and computers aren't perfect. You know, I don't, I don't know why these things happen, but I always try to keep that, keep that in mind for everybody as well. And as far as finals go, that concerns me because there isn't that much of a window. But if I don't get a final from, say, a handful of people for some technological reason or something that you sent one in, and and if I didn't see it from you, I will take the extra step, even though you know it's family time, holidays, guests coming over, my birthday is right after the final. That's not the point. The point is. I will try to again be proactive and I hope it doesn't happen to the same people and say somehow I didn't see one, uh, you know, a final from you. Could you double check if you sent it, please resend it. And All the right, safest so thing is to mark W. You can send it to both if you want, because that way you, you kind of you know, cover your bases to the uh, outlook at Mark W. But I have seen things go astray sometimes on either one of those websites. So just resend it. Okay.
And yeah, it. so I just forward it. Uh, if you don't get it a second time, are you able to notify me and then we can like? Oh, yes, yes. But I, I, I think I'll see an email from you. Your emails have come through, uh, I'm pretty sure, right? Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So if there's some reason why it's jammed out, I, I doubt that. I don't see why it would be because you're in my system. I've sent you back at least one set of grades, right? From paper. Yeah, you'd yeah, have two. Both right yeah, now. right. So you shouldn't be okay. I don't know what happened. I, I'm sorry that there was, you know, this delay, but the point yeah, is- It's all good. You won't be penalized, <clears throat> penalized in any way, I assure you. And that's true for everyone in any of my classes. But as far as the final goes, I'll keep my fingers crossed there'll be less technological problems unless we have a storm come up. Oh God, I shouldn't say that. Pardon me. Uh, if we have a big storm and we're, our, our Zoom session is impossible, I'm not sure what we're gonna do. That's never happened. I've taught now three Zoom uh, years or semesters in a row. And so far, every time I give the exam on Zoom, it's been uh, functioning perfectly. So let's just <laughs> keep our fingers, thumbs crossed, whatever the word is. Uh, that that doesn't happen. So the point is that that if I see that's that's that someone who has turned in their papers and you know participated, well, it doesn't matter. If you turned in any work and somehow I don't see a final from you, I will take the extra proactive step of contacting you so you can resubmit it. And at this point, that shouldn't happen, but it could. So keep that in mind. It shouldn't, you know. And, and at this point, if you want me to confirm that I got your final. It's pretty much a given, except no, not really. We just discussed this. So, so I'll say, then add to the the, the, the uh, intro of your email in the same, the body of, you know, just a line or two is enough to say, please confirm you. Got it. And I will do that. And then you'll know it's there, it's entered. It's good. It's gonna be graded, it's logged in, you're great. And then of course you can email me after New Year's and give me till, cause that's a deadline for the grades to be submitted. Uh, and we have a long window, five weeks now. So after New Year's, I will be able to confirm before your grades come out, but not the week between Christmas and New Year's. I'm going to finally get out of town. I haven't for a long time with my family. So just for a few days. But the point is that I will have the grades done and turned in on time. And then anytime after New Year's Day, you can uh, email me if you wanted to, or just wait till they appear in your student cubby. Okay, now is a good time for any of these kind of questions. That's what, what I always reserve the first part of each class for. Anybody have any other questions about, uh, you know, grades, uh, extra credit, uh, or any other kinds of uh, concerns relating to the class credits that you have all been earning? Anybody? Yeah, I have a question. I emailed you about my um, a grade check, and I never heard a response back. Hmm. What's your name now? Because I'm trying to remember what. Yeah, it's Marianne Del Rio. You know, well, that is interesting because that, that I'm pretty good at remembering names when they're something important like that attached to an email asking me. So somehow it's, I don't know. Again, we just were discussing this. Would you resend that? And you will hear from me. I'm going to again say for sure, maybe tonight. I'll try to just do it tonight after, but I do have a class that goes till 9 30. Yeah, uh, for sure. It's not that pressing. I just want to But I'll get back to you by tomorrow and 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 confirm that. It shouldn't be a problem. Okay. So of course. Somehow thank you. I don't know why. Maybe it was some similar glitch with the other person who's midterm uh temporarily didn't get logged in. But but you can easily re if I've seen work you gotten emails back from me. You're in my system. I will know then to if you remind me to uh do that. It won't take more than a couple minutes to uh, total up your points and, and summarize that and send it to you as an email by tomorrow at the latest tomorrow night. Okay. Now's the time to ask any of these questions because we actually have some, some flex time built in and, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I know some of you are going to say, Hey, if I'm not being tested on it, why even bother to log in? But next week I would call it, now you probably think this is stretching a treat visually. But if you've never gone inside a Bernard Maybach or Julia Morgan design building in the Bay Area, this will be what you'll have the opportunity to do next week. 
from my book with the best professional I've worked with a whole bunch of photographers over the years and sometimes I do my own photography uh for like Marin Magazine that article I just showed you guys last week no one sent it one person sent in a link for extra credit remember that option is still out there even though it's this month's issue in December it's still on their website Marin Magazine right you can google that and it would be the title would be um the legacy of chief Marin, I think. I forget what title they, they changed. You know, I don't change title, but you just put in my name and November issue Miwok Legacy or something like that, or Chief Marin Legacy, and you'd get it. The point is the photography uh, is superb that is in my books. And you notice I'm not recording. Those books are hardbound and they're very heavy and I'm not requiring. They're in the, the libraries, but you've already, most of you done all your, your, your second papers. I'm just going to show you some of the most beautiful images from uh, the interiors of buildings all over uh, the West Coast. If I have time, I'll show you some from Hawaii. Julia Morgan did, did buildings in Hawaii before anybody else from the mainland was even trying to design buildings. Well, yeah, they did from like New York with, you know, Courier. She actually went to Honolulu. There were no flights then in the early 20s. If you don't know Honolulu, it's a beautiful city. I love that city. She did the YWCA, uh, which is right next to the Alani Palace, which is the only royal palace uh, anywhere in the United States. Of course, it was for their kings and queens before we took away their island and overthrew their government in the 1890s. You probably know that story. But that that building is, 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 a, is a masterpiece. And the people that work there were just so happy to see someone come and take photos and put them into a book because they were uh, so happy the space itself just led itself to the it's still the ywca almost 100 years later the function of it is still just is working as well as it did the day she finished it but anyway I'll, i'm not sure if we'll get to that but i'll show you certainly some of the ones from northern california that you might choose to go as extra credit to take photos of I the have a question about that. um at Peraluma, i only can see one house but you mentioned there is three like within a one mile but I only find one hmm. that I... Where are you looking? Sure, that's an important at question. At um, no, What do you have, like... What, um, no, I mean, what website or source are you looking at to, to get the address? No, no, no. I went uh, to walk on the street of Petaluma to see it like that. Oh, I think she's asking the about the extra credit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah well, he, here's the thing. If you want to, I could go right behind me. I have that book I held up to the screen. I, right? Didn't I do that? Yeah, with, with the photos, but the captions are not under the photos. So they- No, are, I saw an article that you write on the Press, Democrat, Press Democrats. Yeah, it was an um, interview with me and I had a walking tour back when it yeah. was safe to do. And we went inside some of those houses, not the ones in my book because they're all private residences, but in some public- Oh, okay. But anyway, the point is, it's a good question that those four are an easy option, assuming, well, you could walk between them, but that's a bit of a schlep. <laughs> it's a good uh, slang term. Uh, uh, I'm thinking you drive in your car from one address to the next. If you got your GPS thing on, whatever. I don't even own a GPS system, but of course I know where they are because I was with the photographer when we drove by them and got those photos. Yeah, that's my question. Cause I only to, uh, see like one, and I couldn't mm. find the other ones that I saw in your article. Mm. Well, <laughs> they're there. I know they didn't disappear. In fact, as recently as because I walked like summer. a couple blocks around. <laughs> oh well, you probably <laughs> should. You didn't have your car or someone driving you. Or, yeah. No, no, I I was walking. Oh. Well, you could do that. I mean, it, it's a beautiful part of town. I think Old Town Petaluma is one of the nicest towns in California. You know, Alfred Hitchcock did a movie that was filmed entirely in Santa Rosa and Petaluma in 1942. About, it was in Bodega Bay? Yeah, it's it's called, no, that's, that's, no, that, that's the other one. That's the birds. Oh. oh yeah, that one's a great one. But the earlier one is called Shadow of a Doubt. Um, I guess I could give you guys extra credit for that because he shows the beautiful historic neighborhoods in Santa Rosa, McDonald Avenue area, not far from the JC campus and not the Julia Morgans, nobody, thought about her in 1942. She she was forgotten by then, even though she was still doing work for William Randolph Hearst at his castle. Uh, but she her career had mostly been before that. So it's not about her houses, but the towns and the, ch the churches and the train stations 
and all these historic buildings. He loved Northern California. He stayed in both Petaluma and Santa Rosa when he filmed that movie. It's 1942. It won several Academy Awards. It's called Shadow of a Doubt. It's one of his best films. I know it's black and white. <laughs> My daughter wouldn't watch it because of that, but it's it's a masterpiece. You look it up on the internet. It's It's been always rated as one of the top 100 movies, American movies anyway. Um, it's called Shadow of a Doubt and you could watch it. And if you wrote something about what you saw in there, that is, you know, those historic buildings, they're all still there. That's what I liked about working on that book, the ones in Petaluma. They're there, I, I guarantee you. And did you have the addresses with you? Because then maybe it's just something about the GPS you were using or a map that you didn't have. Uh, they're yeah, there. I was looking for the address that I found on your article and then oh. I... Oh, you were using just the article. I don't know how. Yeah, and then I was. Uh, but in my book, uh, they're correct. However, if you need the addresses, you can email me. Oh, okay, perfect. And you can get back. Uh, I can then send you just the addresses, and then you'll have to do the, you know, geographic yeah. locating. <laughs> okay, but they're okay, there. I know they are, and you can see all four of them from the sidewalk. Uh, or else I wouldn't send uh, people. I would tell you guys to go out and look for them if you choose to. One photo of the outside of each with the address below each photo, your name and the class, email me a PDF in color, of course, and you get 10 points. But it's, it's just interesting to see them too, the variety. She was an amazing woman. She did 750 buildings. I think I said that, right? Frank Lloyd Wright, who had a much longer career and no sexist barriers to him, of course. He did 550. So he has the second highest output, not the greatest of any American architect. She has that record. Pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I will send you the addresses if you if you ask me by email. Okay. Any other questions now? Because we should, we're, this is important stuff because we're not in a rush now. I deliberately built in a little bit of, of uh, flex time, I call it, or you know, leeway for this kind of thing, as well as next week when I will show some slides of places that many of which you can go to, well, once it's deemed, depending on who owns the building, you know, safe to enter probably with a mask, of course, uh, just to look around. And many of them are open to the public and those that aren't, you could still see, you know, by driving, like the ones in Petaluma. I will show you some slides of a really good professional photographer who did the photos for all three of my books, including the, the ones on Julia Morgan, that is part of your reading assignment, only three chapters of it, and the Maybach book, which, uh, uh, he and I worked on, oh gosh, it took us two years because his buildings are all over the Western US as are hers. Okay, any other questions about extra credit grading or anything? So we should get started, all right, with the uh, first slides. Okay, now this is going to be somewhat of a surprise, I'm guessing, for some of you because, in, well, if you read Stockstead, it shouldn't be the chapter uh, that this is in. Uh, I can't remember which photo she is or what photo she uses. Um, this is our first must know for today. Okay, so uh, you want to take this down. Now it's number three on the list. If I, I've said this before, I reserve the right for variety's sake, so my lectures don't get stale, right? To uh, move around the order in which I discuss some of the slides, but they're all within the same category here. Okay, so this is Johnson, the last name of the architect is Johnson. And of course, everyone knows that's J, well, maybe not. <laughs> I'll spell it J O H N S O N. The glass house. Now, those words I know you guys already can spell, of course. The glass house, 1949. Well, the architect, this architect's name was Philip Johnson, uh, was one of the 20th century's American greatest American architects. Uh, here we go. We're just starting now with the first slide. If you just joined us, it's a glass house by Philip Johnson. You just have to write his last name, Johnson, 1949. So Philip Johnson was one of the leading 20th century American architects. He was uh, an acquaintance of, you wouldn't want to say friends, they were rivals. You could say an acquaintance and rival of Frank Lloyd Wright's. They were from the same generation. And Wright was by far the more famous. You probably mostly never heard of Philip Johnson, but he did a lot of buildings, a few hundred anyway. You could say he did everything from skyscrapers to single family homes, just to keep it simple. It's part of the meaning, of course, who was Philip Johnson. Very successful 20th century architect, one of the most successful American architects of the past century, roughly the same generation 
as Frank Lloyd Wright, but they were they were rivals. They knew each other, but they kind of dissed each other's work. You, could, you have to write it that way. But they criticized each other's work. However, with this house, there's no real conflict with Wright because there's no attempt to rival his styles. Remember, we covered that last week. So you definitely want to know those. The two main movements, there are several that Wright can claim credit or could <laughs> claim credit for when he was actively uh, designing. And one is called Prairie, the first movement, and some people call that early modern houses that he created uh, and coined the term. And then also he coined the, the second movement, the term for it is Usonian. We've covered that. If you didn't see that lecture from last week with Frank Lloyd Wright houses, you want to watch that. There's, there's a good chance one of those two houses by him will be on the final. Okay, so this one, I'm not cutting it from the study list, it's pretty important, is not the first, here's the irony, it isn't the first uh, all or uh, glass house. It isn't the first all glass house in the United States. That was built sometime in the earlier 40s, just I don't remember, say, just say a few years earlier, same decade, you know, in the earlier uh, part, a few years before of the 1940s, I think it was done right after World War II, by a German um, uh, architect, he was an immigrant, you don't have to know his name for this slide, you can just say there was an earlier version of Glass House designed by another architect, but it was Johnson that gets the credit for supposedly inventing the glass house because of this home. Why? Because it was on the cover of magazines all over the United States. It was on TV shows. Uh, it was used in later in movies. It's even been in album covers. Yeah, rock album covers have used this house. At least Billy Joel's did in 1980 something. <laughs> And he said, uh, yeah, Glass Houses, I think he called that album. Yeah, so this became an iconic, that's the way to write it in your notes, iconic type for anyone else after this house who wanted to try this new idea of an all glass house, meaning what? Well, the walls are made of glass with metal framing. We'll talk about the construction and all the elements or materials, I mean, when we do the formal analysis. So just say the walls are entirely made of glass. That's why they call it the glass house. Now, of course, you need some privacy when you're going to the bathroom. So the bathroom is enclosed, as is the, you know, chimney for heating and, and all that in the, in the uh, various times of year. So let's now talk about what are the negative aspects. The house was a hit, was it was a major popular you know, success, because like I said, it got promoted so much by the media, you know, not just architecture magazines, Life magazine, look, you know, it wasn't always on the cover, but it was, there were articles about it uh, in many different magazines. So here we go. Welcome back. We're just doing the first house, the glass house. So why, why would this house was so popular is the obvious reason probably that it was so radical and so different. Most people had never thought about trying to live in, let alone build themselves, you know, or pay an architect to design an all glass house. But do you know why? Because for good reasons. So this is the other part of the meaning. Can anybody here, let's, I'm gonna open this up to, you know, there's no right or wrong here, but if you're looking at this photo and you're seeing a house like this with all glass walls, can anybody think of uh, one or two, uh, you know, disadvantages? of living in an all glass house there's more than one why they didn't catch on with the majority of american home builders after this just with a few you know experimental ones you know that, yeah you have zero privacy yeah well that's you, a big maybe one. five percent privacy but <laughs> privacy is an issue yeah five percent of the time depending on <laughs> other factors <laughs> yeah yeah okay that's number one this was is part of the meaning now on an eight acre lot, or you could just say multi, you don't have to say eight acres, multi acre lot. And it was built for an artist, a very successful artist in rural Connecticut. Well, that's nice if you own several acres, then your privacy issue is minimal. But even then there could be some issues, right? If someone's coming to visit you. <laughs> and so, you know, in any case, yeah, it wouldn't work in an urban setting very well, or just say the privacy issue would be really a big negative in any urban or suburban setting. 
Okay, that's that's the most uh, obvious one. What other, anybody can think of any other disadvantages that a glass house might well, present? I'd hate to be there during winter. Okay, good good point. And and I know why you say that, but if you yeah. want to just- Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, that glass in the winters in Connecticut, it, 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 I would think it'd be freezing and everything would fog up. I have no idea. Well, yes, basically it would, although the house has uh, radiated uh radiant floors? heat from the floors yeah ah. but your your point is well taken regardless so if you you guys are writing this the second big disadvantage heating bills <laughs> in the winter sounds like you know something about new england winters they're, they're not mild i mean at least the ones i've been through i've been to new england several times in the winter you can get snowbound easily and stuck for days in the same place uh, so in, especially in rural Connecticut like this, uh, yeah, your, your heating bills would be astounding. And even if the glass is tempered in a way that doesn't fog up, that's an interesting point. No one else has brought that up. I don't think that would been, they would have thought of that. And even if it can be heated adequately, your heating bills would be monumental. I mean, that's a big problem for most people, middle class or, or working class families couldn't afford that. And then can we think of a third one? It has to do with safety. Okay, let's say you have uh, yourself, a small child, or you have in-laws visiting with, you know, toddlers or preschoolers, and they're, you know, inside your house. What could happen? Anybody? No sound buffer. Well, that's interesting. No one's brought that up either. I'm thinking more of a physical safety, a uh -huh. danger, actual danger. Anybody, I guess nobody here has watched the little kids running around and when they're you know in someone else's like broken oh yes i think you could you could the little kids could easily not even realize that there's a glass wall and run right into it and they seriously hurt themselves quite seriously so for adults probably not but even adults could do that too right especially at night you know well i guess it would reflect the light interior light so but the point is it's not as safe as a normal house with solid walls because the glass is at times invisible. I think that's right. Where do you say not visible? And therefore it would be, uh, you know, a, a danger you could say, or risk of uh, even certainly small children, but possibly even adults uh, injuring themselves. So with all those negatives, this style of house only caught on with a few hundred people, mostly in the hills. Like if you drive up through Hollywood, some of you, up in the hills, you know, above Hollywood proper, I'm talking about, you know, it's all LA. You know, Hollywood's not a town. There's no such town as Hollywood. It's a neighborhood in the city limits of LA. People don't get that when they go there, even some from California. The tourists say, where's City Hall? No, no, City Hall's downtown. <laughs> it's just the name of a district in LA. And up above that in another section of LA are uh, a few dozen of these kind of houses, maybe if that many, at least a dozen glass houses. Because when they were built, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, there wasn't as much, you know, uh, there weren't as many neighbors or, or as many developments. And if they had a big lot, maybe they, with lots of trees, they could still even now have some privacy. But, but many of them aren't practical anymore because when they were built, it wasn't an issue. But now, as you know, LA is burgeoning. It's, what is it, 4 million people in the city of LA proper? 14 million in greater LA. So, of course, now many of these houses are almost obsolete because of that. Although they don't have in California is as big an issue with the heating bill. Okay, so you could just summarize it by saying those three uh, disadvantages cause most people to not uh, want to build this style of house, but some well more well off, well wealthy basically, or well off, however you want to word that, uh, uh, builders could could uh, uh, you know make this work if they had no small children and a lot of land around it or privacy, you know, uh, <clears throat> visual barriers. We'll call it that, like trees. Okay, so that's the uh, entire meaning. So formal analysis, of course, there's only, well, there's three materials here. They're real, all real textures of smooth glass, of course, smooth um, metal, that's painted metal framing, and smooth concrete, polished, it's, 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 or sanded. You can just say smooth con concrete, could be rough or smooth, right? And then concrete floors that have the radiated heat are smooth. So all three textures are smooth. Oh, and then this is brick, by the way, if that's not obvious. And that's also smooth because they don't want, you know, homeowners wouldn't want 
Uh, you can see a little more of the texture here, but that's too small an image. If it's on the exam, you'd have this size of uh, photo to look at. Um, so there is actually, I should have said a fourth texture, uh, but it's also smooth. The smooth, again, sanded brick. You know, br brick is usually rough, but here they sanded it down for the bathroom <laughs> and central utility core. Remember that phrase, that comes from Frank Lloyd Wright. We covered that last week. He conce conceived that idea. So all the systems for heating and plumbing and wiring are in that central core and uh, as well as the bathroom. <laughs> okay, and then it's totally stable. I mean, you could say, okay, yeah, this, the utility core has somewhat of a curve to it. So that's one part, that's it, but it's like almost entirely. Uh, overwhelmingly stable with straight lines, a horizontal shape. It's really only one mass, unless you want to separate the utility core where my cursor is. Uh, you could then say it's two masses. Um, for space, uh, this was only about 800, and, uh, a little over 800 square feet. I think it was, or just say around, it might even have been a little less. It's around 800 square feet. That's not very big. Uh, and the ceilings were low. Uh, the ceilings were only about, uh, they were less than 10 feet high. I think they were like nine feet. Um, <clears throat> both Wright and Johnson did that. And I think it's because they were both short, <laughs> uh, shorter than the average American man at the time they were working. In any case, they lowered the height of ceilings by, by example, because then it became the norm to have lower ceilings in modern ranch houses, if you ever lived in one or have friends who had. Uh, so certain people in the NBA couldn't couldn't live in a house like this or barely. It, the, the, the ceilings are well under 10 feet. In fact, they're closer to eight and a half or nine to so say, you know, not about nine feet or under 10 feet. So that's the space. It's one big open room with, with one enclosed sp space for the bathroom and uh, about 800 square feet and uh, ceilings that are around nine feet tall. Okay, and then we have the rhythm of the framing. That's really the only rhythm there is, right? The metal framing around the doors and the, the uh, walls. Uh, the color is neutral because the glass is transparent and the metal is painted black. Now you can't see the color on the floor. So I would say it is actually a warm, maybe you could sort of tell a warm kind of uh, pink color. It's painted, the concrete, but you, it's hard to see. So you could just stick to the walls and the framing, which are neutral. There's no warm or cool colors there. Um, and let's see, uh, balance, yes, it is. It's symmetrical, clearly balanced. Um, and there's no technique for modeling. It's just the shadows that the sun would create. And lines are visual lines, of course, around the glass panels. I'm gonna give you a little teaser about next week uh, when you see, when I show you the really spectacular views of some of Frank Lloyd Wright. Sorry, I meant Maybach's, I misspoke. Uh, Maybach and Julie Morgan's buildings in the Bay Area. Uh, Bernard Maybach designed a nearly all glass house in 1914. And it's one of my, I know the owner, he's a friend of mine. He's a world famous art dealer, Foster Goldstrom. His galleries are all over the world. You, few of you may even have been to one of them. I one in San Francisco and LA and Paris and London. Obviously he's well off. He, he claims that should get the credit for being the first glass house in the United States and having photos of it, I'll show you next week, you decide, it is about two thirds of the walls are glass in that house. In the entire living room, the largest room in the house is all glass all the way around. 1914, that's 35 years earlier, but he doesn't get that credit. He didn't push for recognition. He wasn't an ego maniac like Wright and Johnson were both ego egoists and so they promoted themselves and the media went along with it so as i said this isn't even the first all glass house in the u.s that was a few years earlier by a german immigrant all right you don't have to write that but you'll see what i mean if you are with the lectures next week uh, i think i have slides i'm sure i do of that one that maybe did okay let's go to the oh i forgot i had this view oh my goodness <laughs> i forgot i had this i added this recently because it gives you a better idea so you don't have to write any more now but you can see there was an artist that lived here. That's sculpture, right? And a painting, landscape, of course. And then this person has added, see, this is a more recent photo. That's one reason I wanted to use it. And here you see the brick and the floor. The floor actually is brick over the concrete. They added the brick years later. So this really isn't an accurate view. If it's on the exam, I would choose the first 
photo because this doesn't show you the whole house. But it is a kind of a helpful image to see how it would look if you were inside. The other photo, in case it's not obvious, was taken from you know a few dozen yards over here looking this way because there's your utility core. Uh, and it's, it looks to me like it's gotten, it's, it's, it's darkened with age. This photo is much more recent, but, but not brand new. It's probably 20 years old. Because the house is what, good grief now, about 70 plus years old. So what you see here, the floor has been covered with uh, brick because concrete is not always comfortable, let alone, you know, pleasant to walk on uh, when it's very cold or hot outside, frankly. So uh, the brick is, is somehow extra insulation. But this is original, the ceiling's original, and obviously the walls are. So you can see how it would be. And this person added cabinets <laughs> to the back that weren't there. Well, let's double check, I'm <laughs> pretty sure. Mm, yeah, they aren't at either end. So this is an older view or original, that's how it originally looked. So they needed some more you know, storage. I guess that's not extra privacy. So the bathroom is on the back side of this, the entrance to it. Not a very large bathroom either. Okay, now, here we go. Let's see. Uh, the next architect we're going to see is, I'm going to do this. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead. I hope it's here. It should be. Maybe I cut it. I might have cut it. So yeah, all right. So here's what we're going to do. I will give you guys a break. I have to because there's a slight disconnect, not a minor one, but not huge either. For the uh, second slide down, right, uh, under week 15, this, this week's lectures, I have the right architect, uh, but this is a different structure than the one that I put on the syllabus. Uh, so since I didn't update it, you guys can just listen. And if you want to take notes, it's uh, it's okay if you don't. I'll keep it brief though. Um, this one is the French architect named, some of you heard of him, I imagine. There've been documentaries about him and he's been mentioned in some feature films even. He's the Frank Lloyd Wright of France. He used to be nicknamed Le Corbusier or Corbusier is how I think it's pronounced there. L-E, so for those who want to write this, but you are going to be tested on it. S uh, two words, capital L-E, then capital C-O-R-B-U-S-I-E-R. -E I was going to show you a house, a modern house he did called Villa Savoy. He called it a machine for living. And I think it literally is what he did, it was create a machine that I don't know about other people, but I wouldn't want to spend my life, you know, living in, let alone raising a family in a machine. It's a really kind of sterile looking house. But since I don't have that slide, you won't have to be tested on that. And you could, if you just want to now cross off, because we're going to do this when we do the review, the uh, actually it's the second slide down. I'm sorry to say I, I didn't put that one in here. I meant to substitute it been a little busy lady. So Villa Savoy is not going to be on the final. So you don't have to worry about it or take notes even. But I want you to see this. This is a totally different building by the same architect. This is a, a, a cathedral in, in central France. How, you can see it's in the countryside. It's not in a big city. And here he used varieties of texture, color, form, materials. In other words, he, he was actually giving you something to remember Sullivan uh, th that he is his work may easily be remember the one slide of his was a skyscraper. Uh, we, we covered last week. Uh, Sullivan, what the the really the first great modern American architect, the one that taught Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, if you heard last week's lectures, um, he said that uh, great buildings should have something to delight the eye of the beholder. Well, apparently Le Corbusier abandoned his own sterile style and his concept of less is more where no ornament no color no variety of texture was used in any of his residential work it's soulless i'm sorry k-r-a-p can i say that word and if you think i'm exaggerating or just me watch a film called fahrenheit 451 by a french director who grew up in one of le corbusier's housing projects warehousing the poor he called it uh, and uh, as Francois Truffaut, he's some people call him the greatest French movie director. He made a movie of Ray Bradbury's novel, Fahrenheit 451, and he shows this soulless future society where books are banned 
and everyone has to live in these cubicle houses that Gula Corisay decide as a negative comment on the Corisay's architecture, even though he's from France and grew up in the same area where Corbusier was from, which is Marseille. Uh, it's in the south of France. You don't have to know any of that, but just for those who might be interested, there's another extra credit option. If you watch that movie, you'd get credit for describing the settings in the movie, not the plot. It's with uh, Oscar Werner and Julia, oh, I can't I never remember her name, won several Academy Awards. Oh, they're two of the top actors of that era. I think the movie was made in 1971. What movie? It's called Fahrenheit 451. It's in English. The director was Francois Truffaut one of the all-time greats. Did anybody see Close Encounters of the Third Kind? I'm not adding another film for you to consider. That one wouldn't be art-related very much, uh, visual arts. It's a great film, though. He's in that movie as a, as, a, as a minor character, the director I'm talking about. So, yeah, he, he was world famous, Francois Truffaut. And in that movie, he literally, he's saying without saying it in obvious ways, this is soulless and, and inhumane architecture because uh, the Corbusier wanted everyone to live in high rises with no grass and no trees around them. It's a horrible concept. So that's probably what happened as I cut that slide because I didn't like it, but I, I, I'm substituting this one, but I won't add it to the list. Uh, don't worry. I'll just finish up on this and we'll get to the next must though. Again, everybody got that Fahrenheit 451, Ray Bradbury, some would say his greatest novel. I think he was the greatest science fiction writer of all time, but then I'm biased. I grew up reading his books when I was a kid. Okay, so this is a church, a Catholic uh, cathedral out in uh, rural France, and he's making the roof line into something like, actually the angle is kind of odd here, but it, it resembles, and he meant it to resemble, the horns of a water buffalo. <laughs> and he textured the concrete and then gave it color. You can see that, but it's the stained glass windows that are so remarkable. I don't have a slide of the inside of it. I couldn't find that on the internet. These windows where my uh, cursor is pointing are thick, thick stained glass in all primary colors, uh, reds, blues, greens, yellows. They're wonderful. And when the sun shines through them inside, it makes a magical effect. And then this is the bell tower. Now this he was borrowing from Wright because that's like the central utility core only of course much taller and obviously now at the corner instead of in the center of the building. It has the utilities that heat and cool the church and keep the electricity, all the systems are in there. And at the top there is, you have to walk around behind it to see an open bell, belfry, right? Where they, the bells ring when it's time to come to church. Yeah, I like this building. It has variety of form, shape. It's totally different than anything else. Well, at least than the residential work that Le Corbusier did, very different. But we are not gonna, you know, you don't need to take those notes. So now this one, yes, this is, this is an interesting example of what can happen uh, when uh, form follows function is taken to its extremes. Okay, I'll explain what that is in a minute. But first, the first thing you obviously need to write is the title. Uh, it's uh, the uh, architects first. I'm sorry, I meant the architects. Two, they work together. Mies, am I, it's, it's sorry, his, he's the German guy I was talking about earlier. I'll explain how they, they ended up working together. Johnson, right? Philip, you can write his name first if you want. The guy we just talked about did the glass house. It was one of the two architects, Johnson. And then the other guy's last name is German, was Mies, M, capital, of course, M-I-E-S. Second word, Von, V-A-N. Third word, Der, or Der, D-E-R. And his last name was Roja, capital R-O-H-E. For short, architects just call him Mies like he was a god, okay? He was probably the second most famous architect in the world at, while Frank Lloyd Wright was the, the most famous. They definitely were from the same generation, but he was German and he left when Hitler threatened to uh, arrest and send to concentration camps any artists he didn't like in Germany. You may know this story. If you don't, it's an interesting, There, there's another, there's so many documentaries on that. You could easily find one for extra credit if you chose, about Hitler's hatred for modern art, uh, any kind of modern art. So Mies van der Rohe worked at the um, uh, <clears throat> school in Germany called the Bauhaus. And we are going to see that. Let's see, let me just see, we're gonna get to that. Now that I think about it, that's probably on the previous. Yeah, hang on, we'll get to that. We'll get to that on, uh, 
yeah, let's get to that on uh, uh, Wednesday, okay. So what do we have here? We have the Seagram building, okay, everybody understand? Did they may need me to respell Mies? The, the, his name is rather long. And Johnson with the two architects. Seagram Building is the title. S E A G R A M. Seagram Building, 1958. Okay, what are we looking at? A glass and steel box, of course, in the form of a skyscraper. Or you could say that it is the style this is called, is I gave you this, remember, is one of the five main movements of early modern architecture, Bauhaus, that's a German word where the style was created, B capital, B-A-U-H-A-U-S. I'll say it again slowly, B-A-U-H-A-U-S. That's the name of the style of this Bauhaus in German. It's called that by most architects around the world, but there's another more easy to remember way of describing, same concept, it's synonymous, this term, international style. I like that even better because that's what's happened, as you all know, if you've ever been any downtown in America or anywhere else in the world, the city over, you know, even 200,000 or more is going to have glass and steel skyscrapers dominating the skyline. So it became an international style, and this building helped set that trend. It's one of the first glass and steel skyscrapers, it's the first famous one. And yes, if you're curious, some of you know Seagram, the liquor company, <laughs> right? It's actually they're Canadian. Uh, the Seagram's uh, liquor company was the one that hired two of the most famous architects in America. I don't know if, if Wright was even asked or didn't want to do it. Wright only designed about three skyscrapers, maybe four or five, a handful, and none of them this tall. So for whatever reason, they chose two of the other leading, they, certainly uh, Mies van der Rohe was, was better known around the world than Johnson. And he was almost as famous as Frank Lloyd Wright during their lifetimes. And they were also rivals. <laughs> yeah. So here we have Johnson who designed the first glass house, uh, what a decade, almost a decade earlier, being chosen to help design as the American architect along with the German immigrant architect uh, the one of the first, you can't say thief first, one of the first glass and steel skyscrapers in the United States, which began a whole movement. And it's still with us today. I don't know how any of you feel about this, but I had to work in one of these buildings for years in time, time life of my summer jobs when I was working way through college. I'd come home and stay with my you know parents in LA because you know I couldn't afford summer rent when there were no classes. So I'd come home and work selling books on the telephone in the Time Life building in downtown LA, which is a glass and steel box, a soulless glass and steel box. And it's, they're like beehives. That's, that's actually what they're meant to evoke is the concept of worker bees going into their cubicles, their little you know small spaces on each of those floors. It's a 40 story tall building. We'll talk about the dimensions when we do the formal analysis, which is very efficient. In fact, this is what I, now you should write this because I said it before I gave you the title. So I'll repeat this. This is an example of taking the concept form follows function, which was not coined to remember, but popularized by Sullivan. It's an example, this building of taking that concept form follows function to an extreme. There is no ornament. There is no color. There's no variety of texture and material. It's strictly a functional, efficient building, which works well for the corporate headquarters that it is. It works fine for that purpose. But let's go down here and see, look at the entrance. No grass, no plants, nothing of green, <laughs> you know, anything green, no artwork, no fountains, no statues, no decorative features of any kind. So you weren't supposed to be distracted when you work in this. This is not my exaggerating. It's what the purpose of the building was. The owner said to himself, when our workers arrived here in the morning, we wanted them to go straight to work with a mindset that would be productive. And, you know, of course, that's fine. I mean, that is what they were hired for. But a little something, a little color, a variety, uh, maybe a couple of works of art, you know, like outdoor sculpture or, you know, some greenery. No. That would distract the people that were supposed to work as the bee worker bees inside this beehive-like building. 
Um, obviously, you could tell it's not my favorite style, but you know, a lot of people love it. And certainly it has its own form of beauty or aesthetics in that, you know, especially when it's getting near dark, I chose, I could have chosen a daytime view, which would definitely be less interesting. But at night, you know, when the lights are on and, you know, it's getting dark early, like this time of year, it might have a certain attractiveness, of course, because the, the lights make it look like it's warm, but it's not. That's the interior lighting. The building is strictly uh, colorless. It's just black painted metal and, and uh, transparent glass panels. That's it. Except for the concrete posts that uh, will be down there again, that line the, uh, uh, you know, the lobby. Those concrete posts are the only other material. Now, just for a point of comparison, anybody see the original movie of Ghostbusters with Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray? If you haven't, no, no, whatever. I'm not going to recommend that one. That's not really for extra credit because it's not about art. But they, at the end of that movie, the original Ghostbusters, that team goes into this building. And they and this is an, I, the point I'm, why I'm making is that this building and that are exactly the same height. They're both 40 stories. And I did some research. They're almost the same square footage. And they serve a similar function. This was a, I think, insurance company. But this building has some shapes, varieties, form, color. And if you know in that movie when they're walking up the staircase, oh, Art Deco, they describe some of the architectural decorative features that that style had. These buildings are exactly 30 years apart. Is not, you don't have to know that, but you can just say uh, buildings around it before this building had variety of decorative details. And this style totally abandons that and became the norm for corporate headquarters and other types of large public buildings all over the world. First in the US, of course, and then it spread all over. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so this building was from a different era, a totally different philosophy. That, that would be more what Sullivan wanted, which is a, a building a good or great building should have something to delight the eye of the beholder. Uh, that's not the case here. This philosophy, here we go, the last thing about the meaning, coined, the term coined by Mies van der Rohe, which is similar to form follows function, but that was Sullivan that, that popularized that. But he, Mies, they just call him Mies, so you just write M-I-E-S, he helped create this style when he was in Germany back in the 20s. And, and it wasn't for skyscrapers, it was just for smaller buildings. He said, this is the philosophy I believe in, less is more. And that sums this type of architecture up brilliantly. For better or for worse, the buildings have a whole lot less of everything that many other buildings around them do. And he felt that was a good thing, less is more, was his philosophy and the concept behind this style of the international style of Bauhaus. Okay, so that's the whole meaning. Let's do a formal analysis. Um, balance, yeah, totally symmetrical, completely. The rhythm is obvious with each floor and the window framing repeated over and over. The colors neutral. Don't be fooled by the lighting from inside. It's only black painted metal and transparent glass. And of course the materials we've covered, but I'll repeat them are smooth, real textures. The, the textures are smooth glass, smooth metal and smooth concrete on these uh, post on the ground or in the entrance way. Okay, and then we have, it, it's totally stable. There's nothing dynamic. There wasn't meant to be anything dynamic. It's a single mass. I don't think you can break it down at all. So I say just one mass. Here the lines are visual, right around each floor uh, and around the windows if you got up close. So there are visual lines here, uh, but there's no carved or, or painted lines. Um, let's see, uh, modeling, no, there's no technique for modeling. There isn't meant to be. There's just whatever shadows in the daytime, of course, it's a night view, so there wouldn't be shadows. But in the daytime, it's just whatever natural shadows the sun creates. Uh, and for space, I'll give this slowly because this is the most important thing. With, with architecture, space is the most important element of composition, of course. It is a 40-story tall skyscraper with hundreds of uh, smaller offices on each floor, uh, smaller and larger, I should say, the different size. You can say a variety of, of uh, office sizes on each floor, hundreds of offices total. So dozens, I guess, on each floor uh, with different sizes and one large open lobby or entryway, you could say. Well, it's the lobby actually. So there's a lot, the largest room is the lobby in just past the entryway. And then the upper floors, each one has dozens of offices of varying sizes. And it's a 40 story skyscraper, which is about 500 feet tall. 
I think it's just under that, but it's nearly or around 500 feet. That's the real space, of course. Okay, let's do, we should at least be able to do one more and end on time. Let's see, did I skip anything here? No, we'll do this next one. I love this structure. Some of you may have, if you ever flown out of JFK Airport in New York, you you may have been inside this building. It's, it was the International Terminal, but I don't know if it's still, I think it still is. Okay, the architect's name is Sarinen. That's a Finnish, uh, having known a Finnish exchange student in high school. I, I learned from her that everybody's name and almost everyone's last name in Finland has double constant, uh, double vowels, sorry. S-A-A-R-I-N-E-N. -E Again, S-A-A-R-I-N-E-N. -E Sarinen is how you pronounce it. And this was the TWA, as in the former era. It's defunct now, right? But it's still usually called. And that's the original purpose. It was built by TWA, uh, the airline, of course. TWA, all capital letters, terminal. TWA terminal, 1963. Okay, so first, who was Sarinen? He was Finnish, as I mentioned a moment ago, but now you should definitely write that. He was an immigrant from Finland where he had made a, an international, he was well known before he came to America, an international reputation for innovative modern buildings that were, here's another term, I could have put it on the term or li list, I mean, of terms to know, but I didn't think I should do that. You have enough already, uh, but it's part of the meaning of this. So you need to write in that, you know, set of notes for this slide biomorphic one word pretty much like it sounds biomorphic but i'll spell that b-i-o-m-o-r-p-h-i-c biomorphic one word which means that the design of something if it's biomorphic whether it's a piece of sculpture a building uh, or a painting any any visual art if it's biomorphic that means it's inspired by living things inspired the design of which is inspired by living things and with architecture that isn't easy to do but now that i've said that that's the definition i already got that for biomorphic this is a classic example of biomorphic architecture by one of the world's lead, he was one of the leading architects in the world when i was a kid his name was you know mentioned in the news quite often wright had died a few years earlier so so he was another generation Okay, so what living thing could this be inspired by? Well, look at them, I'm giving you guys a clue. Anybody wanna take a set? Th th this here, right on this side, there's sections of a building which often are called wings of a building. And then what's this here? Anybody think what this could be supposed to be, you know, very, of course. Oh, I thought more like uh, some sea fish. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't but maybe it's up there. Oh yeah, actually I could see what you're thinking. That isn't a bad idea, but since it's yeah. an airport where people take off and land on like bird? Earth, yes, like a, a giant pigeon? bird, it's supposed to look like an eagle landing with its wings spread out. If you've ever seen videos, nature videos or documentaries of, you know, eagles are pretty large birds. So like a large bird, like an eagle landing, coming in with its wings spread out. And that, this is a bit of an odd angle. That's the best one I could find where that actually looks like the, you know, the beak of the eagle and these are its talons right so it is directly meant to evoke the image of a large bird like an eagle landing and coming in for a landing and of course if it's an airport terminal that's a perfect symbol for this and that was why it was so popular now you could add this uh, this building was inaugurated i'm pretty sure i have this right unless my memory is completely gone on me but i'm pretty sure i saw somewhere in a magazine probably that Jackie Kennedy uh, came here to inaugurate the building when, of course, she was still first lady. Today, by the way, since I brought it up, is the 50, good grief, 58th anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And that will mean a lot to a lot of you, but you know it from history, I'm sure. And I doubt any of you remember it, but I'll never forget that day. That was one of the saddest days in our country's recent history, obviously. Um, <clears throat> for most people, there were a few people that cheered. I was in middle school then, and there were a couple of people, and the teachers just, <laughs> they just claimed that, whatever your thoughts are, don't do that. The man just died in a hail of bullets, and of course, obviously, most people mourned him. So today is November 22nd. It was in 1963, of course, when he died. 
Okay, so what we have here is a building that was classic example of the biomorphic style, and it probably was, in, you know, the word inaugurated or opened, you could just say it that way, uh, by, I'm pretty sure it was Jackie Kennedy and the mayor, of course, of New York, probably, and the head of the airline, you know, a big group of dignitaries. It was already instantly popular, and it was in magazines. I remember seeing pictures of it when I was a kid in, in, in major magazines, because it was so radically different than any other airport terminal. And now it has still a function as part of that airport, which is, of course, named after uh, the assassinated president. And it, these are the rental car offices uh, here, see, on either side. So that's part of the design. But the main part of the building is the eagle-like uh, structure, uh, which was for a while the TWA terminal. And I believe now, anybody been here recently? I haven't flown out in New York in years. Uh, a lot of people still go through this terminal. And it is a, uh, let's see, uh, International Departures Terminal, I think so. Might be right, doesn't matter. You can just say it's still used as a terminal for the airport, the JFK airport in New York City. <clears throat> okay, and so that's pretty much the whole meaning, except I will add that Aerosad Enon also did, this is one last fact about the meaning, the uh, gateway arches in St. Louis that a few of you must have seen photos of perhaps, or if you've ever driven across the US and taken a bridge across the Mississippi when you're going from St. Louis into Illinois or the other way around, <laughs> Uh, you would have seen them. They're 600 feet tall, uh, and it is literally a giant curved concrete arch from which you can see like six states or something because it's all flat there, right? That's the Midwest. Um, that's called the Gateway Arch. He designed that as well as several buildings in Washington, D.C. He was a very successful and prolific architect. He died in his 40s, quite, I think it was in his 40s, pretty young. But during his relatively short career, he, he became uh, world famous. And this is one of the buildings that helped make him that famous. All right, so formal analysis, let's see. Well, first of all, if you were standing right in front of it, it's totally symmetrical, even including the wings where the you know, uh, offices for the you know, rental cars are. It would be completely balanced left to right. Uh, it's hard to say top to bottom, but I think so. If you drew the line here, right, roughly midway across this uh, set of windows, and it's the same over here, I, I think it's balanced both ways. You know, well, actually, that'd be about midway. Depends on how you look at it, but I think of it as balanced both top to bottom and left to right. Uh, and then we have the rhythm of the glass panels and the uh, roof, which is like wings and the uh, supports. You can say columns if you want, but they're not really columns, are they? Well, technically they are, they support the roof. Uh, you know, the legs, if you want to call them that, of, of the uh, giant concrete bird there. Uh, those, are, of course, are exactly the same shape. So there plenty of rhythm here. It's totally dynamic. The only thing stable is the roofs of the, the rental car. There's, that's it. Otherwise, everything in the terminal proper is completely dynamic, not a straight line in that section. The color is neutral. It's uh, kind of an off-white. And the textures are the real smooth texture of glass and metal and real rough texture of concrete. Now here there is modeling. It's meant to be that way. So it's part of the design because in New York in the winter, you don't want, or in this hot summer months, you don't want to be standing out in the open. So while you're waiting for your taxi or your car, you're sheltered by this really wide overhanging, you know, neck and head and beak, you know, the front part of this terminal, which is supposed to symbolize the head and uh, neck of, of, of a, a large bird. And that creates shadows, which are really important, especially in the hot summer months. So actually it's part of the design that there is modeling here. Then the rest of the building just has whatever shadows and natural sunlight creates. Uh, and then we have, um, let's see, I think I already mentioned, oh, space. The space is 40 foot high ceilings on either wing with about a 25 foot high ceiling in the middle. And it's one big open, uh, almost oval, not quite oval shape. The, the structure overall has a kind of an oval, you know, floor plan. And uh, the ceilings range from about 20 feet to about 40 feet at the peak of the, the highest part of the ceilings. Okay, let's see. Uh, I think I'm forgetting. Oh, line. Yeah, here the line is visual line, which of course is where the concrete borders or edges of the building are. And also there is visual line with the framing here. And of course, I already said that creates rhythm, right? Stable. Oh, mass. 
Well, if you break it down, you could say that the largest mass is the terminal, and then this is part of his original design. So you can see there's really only, well, three masses, but two sizes of masses. The main mass being the terminal itself, the largest mass, of course, and then the two equal ones, you can't tell in this photo, but they are of equal length, uh, two side wings uh, where the uh, rental car offices are. Those would be the uh, second largest masses, and that's pretty much it on masses. Okay, I think I've covered everything here and it's just about at the end of what we're normal uh, time for ending class, but I'm gonna stick around to answer any questions. Everybody get everything on this now, this slide, or have any questions about any previous slide before I stop the share. Anybody have a, a question about a slide that we've just covered that you think I might've overlooked or that you didn't catch in your notes? Because we have it like 90 seconds before I should just stop the lecture and then stick around as always for any questions you have when I'll put it back on uh, the uh, speaker view. Anybody have any questions about any slides we've covered or anything else we covered earlier today like grades and you know extra credit or anything like that. All right I'm gonna stop share and then stick around like I said is, is part of my um, usual procedures that allows any questions that anyone has. Anybody have anything that's on top of your mind? Again, I did say this, but some people joined us a little late after this, that if for some reason you didn't get a grade on your midterm, I don't think that's more than one or two people now, and you know you turned it in, send me an email, resend it to Mark W at AOL, and I will confirm I got it and grade it within 24 hours and get it back to you. Okay, anybody else have any questions about anything from today or anything relating to the extra credit or any grading? issues, questions? No? Nope. Always give you guys a minute in case someone thinks of something. <clears throat> well, okay, don't forget we do have a lecture and some of the slides that I'm showing you on uh, Wednesday, we'll end early Wednesday, but not super early, probably about 4.05 or something like that. Uh, but we do have several more must knows and at least one of those is, is, is a distinct possibility. I won't say very, very high probability, but could easily be on either the uh, slide essay or uh, slide edification part of the final. So you should you know, get notes from that. Of course, both lectures today's and Wednesday's will be posted on Amazon. I'm going to start saying by Saturday at noon because sometimes Friday gets just too crowded and I don't get to it till after <clears throat> my daughter's asleep and all the other stuff's over. The day's activities are done. So if, if that happens, you wouldn't want to log on at 11 p.m. or something. So, so you can certainly see them sometime by the afternoon on Saturday. If you uh, <clears throat> want a double check, then usually no later than uh, early afternoon on Saturday all the remaining lectures, of course, on YouTube. All right, anybody else? Any other questions? I like that, uh, Matt, uh, that's your, what is that? A, it's a kind of bird, isn't it? <laughs> or is it no, a that's dog? My, that's my dog. I oh, got it's very like similar that. to the dog we have. Very similar. What, what breed is that, if you don't mind my It's answer. a poodle, mini poodle. But oh, she, and it's got its hair got up in a bow. Huh. Yeah, yeah, I get lots of questions about that. <laughs> that, that how many pounds? Uh, she's 25 pounds. Oh, a little bigger than I you know. We have an 18 pound Chispaniel. spaniel. Well, that's what my daughter calls it. I think it's an actual term. A, a mixed breed, of course, of mutt that was abandoned by some idiot, you know, when, when she was not even a year old and we adopted her. Uh, we've had her for seven years. She's very happy. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, healthy breed. A mixture. Yeah, you're, you mean the poodles? Yeah, well, it, yeah. you know, Chispaniel spaniel is maybe not a common term. It's a mixture of a chihuahua mm -hmm. and a uh, spaniel yeah a, yeah everything's a poodle now and a span like the names people come up with now I'll never, I, oh yeah always it makes me chuckle <laughs> yeah they're pretty creative don't they <laughs> yeah very creative well okay so one more time i'll double check if anyone has any questions that you didn't have answered already mm -hmm. about anything we've covered today or grading or extra credit okay well all right you guys and i'll see you wednesday and we'll, we'll end several minutes early wednesday but you do want to get the notes from that because thank you very much so this, yeah thank you guys for your thank comments you. and participation and don't forget those people send me an email that wanted me to get back about grades or 
past assignments. Do that right away if you didn't already, so I can respond by tomorrow at the latest. Okay. Right, thank you. See, see you later. Yeah, you guys too. Take care. Have a good two days.